and good evening everyone. My name is Eric Fleming and I am a 481 student and let's just go ahead and jump right into my presentation. Uh, if you're curious on uh, what software I'm using to make this video, it's called Open Broadcast Software. Uh, it's pretty neat, it's free, so check it out uh, if you like it. So the title of my presentation, or more accurately, the title of the paper is called uh, High Dynamic Range Image Display with Halo Clipping and Prevention. So a uh, little, little overview of the presentation. First, uh, I'm going to go over the abstracts. Then we're going to talk about some of the background information, uh, the words that they use that make the method go. Uh, we'll get into some of the details of how the enhancement method works. And then we're going to look at some before and after pictures because uh, it's an image processing class after all. So. Um, there are really advanced cameras that um, can take pictures of images that have a, a high dynamic range. In other words, uh, it's going to exceed 8 bits of intensities. So we know that classically our JPEGs um, are defaulted to 8 bits, but that doesn't mean that there isn't more information out there uh, to be sought. So when we take um, images with um, such high intensities, um, it becomes a problem to display them for one of two reasons. Um, if you have images, or you ha if you have intensities that are too high, you can't just squash them. Uh, that's going to produce um, intensity clipping. So basically, you'll have some curve, and then you'll see this giant bar at a 255, and that's what you see in this image right here. Is uh, inside the light intensities um, are pretty small. But outside, you know, the sun's very, very bright. So that could be anywhere, you know, a thousand times brighter. Um, and all that information is sort of washed out. So we have to find ways of um, preserving information in the image without just um, simply just like being, hey, you know, we'll just do a simple linear transform and um, lose information along the way. You could also have it go the other way, um, where you were actually able to capture those high intensities, but now you've sort of squashed the lower intensities, and that's what you see right here. So in other words, everything inside the room is uh, far too dark, and uh, but we did keep the information in the window pane um, relevant. Uh, it is also worth noting that um, in addition to that clipping that we talked about, there is a halo around the window. And uh, that's something that maybe a human is not seeing. But again, because the high intensities all had to get condensed, um, that curtain appears brighter than it actually is. So the main theory behind um, how this algorithm works is called the Retinex theory of vision. Uh, in other words, our eyes are really good at, at adapting to different light intensities, uh, along with the visual cortex. So while the digital device, which is recording the image, um, is just taking the absolute value of the brightness, we can still use math, which is similar to the you know, biochemical signals that our brain and our uh, retinas are producing, and actually produce an image that it would be like we were looking at it through our eyes. So the main contribution of this theory is this equation right here. So the light intensity is equal to the product of the illumination and the reflectance. So it's basically like saying, yeah, well, even though you maybe captured a pixel that um, has an intensity value of 360, uh, we can decompose it into these two other numbers, uh, one that's higher than 360 and one that's uh, lower than 360. And so uh, when we multiply them, we get something uh, that's going to be there. It turned out that in the research, um, when these researchers, uh, Edwin Land and John McCann, when they were asking people um, a series of questions about colors and intensities, it turned out from their research uh, that value, values for R were very small and that values for R were among the most important in determining uh, what made an image you know, feel like it was uh, an image that the eye was naturally processing. So in the algorithm, uh, long story short, uh, you take an L, right, so what the camera produced, and you split it into its two pieces. Uh, first, what you have to do is you have to estimate what I is, 
and then you divide L and I and that gives you R. So like we said, R was the more important piece experimentally. Uh, the problem is, is that our new image still needs to be a light intensity. So we still need to give it an L, but that means we have to give it a new I. So in other words, uh, for each pixel in the image, we're going to estimate what its I is. And we're going to do some math on it because that range is far too large. Uh, we're going to map it to a smaller I range. And then we're going to multiply our, uh, where's my cursor? Our new I times our new R, and that's going to give us our new light intensity. In other words, uh, what it should look like to humans. And uh, the process for approximating the little I's is simply uh, just take the logarithm, uh, run some low pass filters over it to smooth things out, and then sort of uh, enlarge it a bit, but not as large as it was before by using an exponential function. They said in the results that it was typically around uh, 0 0.4 to 0 0.6, so it's definitely sublinear. Uh, some other things to note that uh, while this is talking about grayscale images, uh, we can't apply this to you know regular color images. We're just going to have to apply this process uh, to each different channel, the red channel, the green channel, and the blue channel. So it still works for colors, you just have to repeat it more than once. So here's all the fancy math. Uh, I'm going to go a little bit faster because I see I've already hit over five minutes. Uh, long story short, double integral. Please do this over the whole image, both dimensions. Um, we are going to figure out the new L by doing the I part um, plus the R part. You might be saying, well, wait a second, the earlier problem had a multiply. Why are you adding? Well, this is just um, a math rule that when you do a log transform, um, multiplications turn into additions. So that's why you see addition here. And uh, the reason why there's this weighted term here is because this is what's calculating your new I. As I said earlier in the previous slide, uh, we have this old I and we're going to transform it and get a new I. And most of that work here is being done by this uh, weight. And um, here is uh, the last bit of information on the nitty gritty of the algorithm is that there is this parameter alpha. So while this algorithm will give us a new image, you as the experimenter need to decide what alpha is. Um, the program is not going to just pick an alpha value for you. So you know, if you wanted to, you could set up a nice little for loop, uh, run it multiple times with multiple different alphas, and then uh, give it to humans and see which one is the best. And that'll give you ideas for what alpha you should be using for uh, certain images. A um, little bit more information on how all of those I's were calculated. Um, it's just like a little bit of a uh, weighted average in the neighborhood, but um, it's doing a gradient. So in other words, it's calculating diagonally how much change is there this way, how much change is there that way, adding those two changes together, and then dividing by the areas so you can get this idea of uh, the average amount of change of I in a little pixel neighborhood. So uh, here's those two images side by side, like I said before. Uh, the first one has a halo effect because uh, the intensities are too bright. Um, however, in the second image, um, it's far too dark, so it got clipped on the darker side of the image. Uh, we use this process to go through and get all of the little illuminations, um, find out their reflectances, and then transform the illuminations to a more suitable range, and we get uh, this guy. So as you can see, we've preserved the information that exists inside the window. Uh, the window has also lost its halo effect, which is what we want. We can kind of see the curtains uh, more naturally. And it turned out for this uh, result, an alpha of 50 was the alpha that we wanted to use. Some notes on alpha. If it's too high, uh, you'll lose some uh, sharpness of detail. And that's, again, due to the low-pass filters that are happening. However, if uh, alpha is too small, you, you won't really notice anything whatsoever. And the researchers did also point out that when you're testing different alpha values, uh, make sure to understand that it's a base 2 scale. So in other words, there's no real point in testing you know, a difference of alpha of 10 or 11, because they're going to be pretty much the same. Uh, you're going to need to go up by multiples of 2 to start to see uh, vast differences, and then you can kind of uh, shrink in a little bit. So you could think about it in terms of 
10, 20, 40, 80, 160, 320, 640, and then find out which one of those is closest to what you want, and then kind of drill in down on that uh, rather than just iterate through you know a thousand of these values. Uh, so that's my presentation. Uh, as you can see, uh, the first resource is uh, the paper itself. But going through it, I did have to research some other topics. Uh, in other words, uh, gamma correction. Turns out that when somebody makes a JPEG, it's already going to uh, clip these intensities for you. And so I needed to know a little bit about uh, how standard cameras deal with different light intensities before I could understand how this uh, paper dealt with different light intensities. Thank you.